And so I have got the incredible privilege, thank you for that, um, the privilege to come and share in our joy with you today. And I'm actually blown away at the songs, I'm blown away at the words that have come through this morning. And I think we need to keep our hearts open because I feel like it's really fulfilling today what God is saying. And there's, there's something that's happening actually. Let's not switch off, but keep hearing what God is saying. So now I'm going to watch my time. Elijah was um, a very faithful prophet of God, and he um, well, he was lived during a very turbulent time in Israel's his, history. Um, it was King Ahab and his very wicked wife Jezebel that were ruling the northern Israel, and they had actually taken wickedness to a new level and had turned um, Israel away from worshiping God and worshiping Baal instead. And because of this disobedience, God sends Elijah. He says, I want you to go and tell him that there's going to be drought. Now, you must understand that Baal was known as the god of the sky. So he was the god of the weather. And there, Israel was swarming with prophets of Baal, and they were killing the prophets of Israel. And so to come and tell Ahab and Jezebel that there's not going to be any rain was a direct insult and humiliation to the prophets of Baal. So he with Elijah was enemy number one in Israel. They called him the trouble of Israel. And God said to him, okay, I'm going to hide you. And he did that to protect Elijah, but also that was part of the judgment. He removed his voice from Israel. So he takes Elijah on this incredible journey where he gets supernaturally provided for and cared for. And he gets fed by ravens, who, by the way, saw food during drought. He gets fed by ravens. He gets um, fed by a destitute um, widow. He raises his son from the dead. And in all of this, God is preparing Elijah for this great faith, for the, the next step. And then he calls him out. So God hides him, and then he brings him back. He says, now I want you to go to Ahab, and I want you to tell Ahab that I'm going to bring rain. But call all the prophets and all of Israel to Mount Carmel, because he was about to challenge Baal. Now, God and the, the, the God of Baal were both known to be to have their voices thunder and lightning and fire as their weapons. So when God says to them, okay, you're each going to have a sacrifice, he said, whichever one where the fire falls and burns up that sacrifice, I am God. So he was directly opposing Baal. And Elijah says to him, when are you going to stop wavering between two opinions? His name was, Elijah meant, um, Yahweh is my God. So we all know Elijah, the prophets dance around, Nothing happens. Elijah calls fire falls, and the whole of Israel fall flat on their face in awe and declare that Yahweh is God. And with that, Elijah goes and he prays for rain. Um, sorry, with that, he, he has all the prophets killed, all the false prophets, 850 of them, and he prays for rain. Rain comes. And this is just the most incredible story. And then Ahab goes back to Jezebel. And tells Jezebel, look what Elijah's done, which is a lie. There's the enemy, because actually God had done it. And Jezebel is furious. And so she gives out a curse. Well, her words are a curse formula. And she says, by the end of tomorrow, you will be dead. And here comes Elijah, this mighty warrior that has done these incredible things for God. And he is terrified. And he runs in terror. And... Um, he runs into the desert where he's out of Jezebel's reach and he sits under a juniper tree or a broom tree, whichever you want to call it, and he says, I've had enough, Lord. <clears throat> Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. And then he lay down and slept. He was absolutely exhausted. He was fed up. He, was, he had tried his best. He emptied himself. And uh, he just wanted to be over. He wanted to die. He was pulling out of the fight. How many of us have been in those moments? How many of us have been in those moments where we want to pull out of the fight? <clears throat> and there can be moments that are short. There can be moments that are long. There can be moments that take you right out of the church. In fact, I have a very sad story where somebody's taken right out of the church, been for years in leadership, and is now agnostic. It's a very, very dangerous place to be sitting under that juniper tree. 
So what happens in these moments? Well, I think the first thing we need to understand is James 5, 16 says, Elijah was a man just like us. Um, in Psalm 103, 4, it says, As a father, he has compassion on his children, and those who fear him, for he knows how we are formed, and he remembers we are dust. You see, if we don't understand our human frailty, then we don't understand grace. We don't understand what it is to show grace to others and grace to ourselves. And our what happened can be, what happened? And it can be accusational, or it can be compassion. So, what happened? And let's actually have a look at how God... Um, Response. Well, the, the first of all, let's have a look what happens under the juniper tree. So the first red flag is I've had enough. You see, God says that he won't tempt us beyond what we can bear, and he will make a way out for us. So when we say, I've had enough, we are losing focus on God. And what happens is we move away from focusing on God, we move into our own understanding. And we start to focus on other people, we start to focus on ourselves, and we start to focus on our circumstances. And it is the most painful place to be. And what happens is, with our own understanding, our view becomes distorted, and we start to see the situation in not a very helpful, a healthy way. We have a look. Some of the thinking patterns we have is we catastrophize. And that's what Elijah did. He said, I'm all alone. Disaster, I'm all alone, which was a lie. He actually wasn't alone. God said to him, there's still 7,000 Israelites that are serving me. And Abadiah had been hiding a hundred of the prophets away during, during the drought. So we catastrophize it. We make it this huge disaster. The other thing we do is we label. He says, I'm no better than my ancestors. I'm stupid. I'm useless. I'm not enough. And we start labeling, which is very cruel and very painful. Another thing we do is we fortune tell. We know exactly what's going to happen. And it's disastrous. We go down that road of the most disastrous results and we start to fortune tell because we've lose, lost sight of the goodness of God. We also go into mind reading. We know exactly what everybody's thinking. I know what they're thinking. I know exactly what that one's thinking. And meanwhile, they're not thinking that. And we're sitting with this painful thing. And the worst thing is that we see only the negative. The positive becomes very dim, we don't see it, and we see only the negative. It's really important in these moments to ask God what we believe in, and to get our perspective back again. What happens as well when we're in this mindset, we go into false responsibility. Um, and we, we see where um, Elijah says, I've been very zealous for you, Lord, but the Israelites are still rejecting you. Israel's failure has become his failure. How does that happen? He was not responsible for, for Israel to serve God, but it becomes his failure. And we see Moses says the same. He says, they keep wailing to me. Give us meat to eat. I cannot carry these people all by myself. The burden is too heavy for me. If this is how you're going to treat me, put me to death. When we start feeling burdened, we have to ask ourselves, whose responsibility am I carrying? Whose responsibility am I carrying? Is there somebody in my life that I'm trying to make do the right thing? Is there somebody in my life that I'm blaming? What is going on? Whose responsibility? We have to put that into the right perspective so that we can not lose our power and take ownership of our own lives. Um, and then the last thing in this, uh, under the tree is we get disappointment, discouragement, and depressed. Elijah said, I just want to die. And, you know, even faithful servants of God can get um, discouraged. Disappointment is part of life, and it's so important that we learn how to respond to it. We have to, let's watch out for blame and regret and guilt. Those are not healthy feelings to have, and they need attention. Um, and what about our expectations? When our expectations are not met, it can feel so disappointing and so discouraging. But I think with expectations... It's really good to assess them. Are they realistic? Or are they unrealistic? Was I right to expect that? Was it right for Elijah to expect the whole of Israel to all of a sudden be on fire and passionate for God? Or was that a very high expectation? Okay, so let's see how God responds. How's my time? Yeah. So um, I'm just going to read from 1 Kings 19 verse 5. It says, he lay down under the tree and fell asleep. All at once an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. 
He looked around and there by his head was a cake of bread over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and then lay down again. Then the angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank. Strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God, and there he went into a cave and spent the night. Now in this passage, we can see that God comes and attends to him. And there are three questions that struck me in this thing. The first question I asked God in this was, this man's exhausted, he's terrified, and you bring him bread. Why bread? So now I'm going to just move a little bit to my story. So I found that my juniper tree pops up at 3 o'clock in the morning, or 4 o'clock, round about there when I wake up, and then all of a sudden, all those mindsets that I've been pointing fingers at all just come back at me, and I go into this heavy mode that I just can't shake myself out of it. And so I decided there were too many lies wafting around in my brain at that time, and I wasn't strong enough to fight them, I was going to actually get my phone, get my Bible app, put it onto audio, stick it in my ears, and go to sleep with the truth of God permeating my brain. And I would wake up feeling lighter and refreshed, and I, I, the other night I slept through eight books of the Bible, and that permeated through my mind, and I love it, quite happy. And so one night was, this had happened and I was sleeping, and I, I literally felt somebody wake me up. And as I woke up, and I asked God, why the bread? And as I woke up, this is what I read in John 6. I tell you the truth. It is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. Whew, for the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry. And he who believes in me will never be thirsty. And so what God does is he comes and he brings in Jesus. And it's Jesus is the one that strengthens us. And he comes and he, first of all, he, he, he comes to strengthen Elijah at this moment. Elijah needs strengthening and he comes and he strengthens him physically. He brings him bread. He says, sleep, rest, have bread. Sometimes we need to just look after our physical bodies because we are tired, and that's why I put the sound on and sleep with it, because my body at that stage has got no strength in it to fight anything. It just really wants to sleep. He also comes and he, he, he strengthens him spiritually. He says, focus on Jesus. He comes and gives him the water. He says, my, I will meet all your needs. Um, and he says... He is the one that's going to sustain you for this journey. And we see that he does. He goes 40 days and 40 nights after that. The next question I asked God was, why hot coals? Why was the bread not just there? Why did he bring it on, on hot coals? Um, now, in the Holy of Holies, there was the mercy seat, and it had the two cherubims over it. And this is where the presence of God was. On the Day of Atonement, Coals of fire were brought into the Holy of Holies and they were placed in front of the Ark of Covenant. And incense was burned so that while the, the blood of the sacrifice was splashed onto the mercy seat, the, the smoke came and covered the, the glory of God so that the high priest would be protected and would not die. And so we, we have a look at this in... Um, in Isaiah 6, so Isaiah has a vision, a vision that he's in the throne room of God, and he says, Woe to me, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips. I have seen the king. Then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin is atoned for. It's a picture of repentance. It's a picture of us and being removed. And when we are under that juniper tree, there is a lot of grumbling and moaning and self-pity that goes on. We, we honestly, I think, sometimes say things that we wouldn't normally say. We're just tired and we're grumpy and we moan. And I, God comes and he calls to him in this moment. He says, you need to repent. And repentance is not something that tears you down. Repentance is this beautiful gift of guilt being removed and of us being able to continue the journey because we are not carrying the sin that is holding us down. Yeah, 
the next question I asked him, so it was, why are the bread, why are the hot coals? And the next one I said was, why did you put the meal at his head? God, that's dangerous. I'm never going to put hot coals at somebody's head. Why did you put it in his head? Why not at his feet? Why not on his side, but he put it on his head? And so if we have a look at this, Jesus um, was the bread, and he wants us to have the mind of Christ. And hot coals placed on your head brings repentance. It says, if your enemy is hungry, give him food to eat. If he is thirsty, give him water to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. And so it's almost like God brings this meal, because in those moments of grumbling, we his enemy. <laughs> you know, we are redeemed, but we're not part of what he's doing. And he comes and he brings this meal to us. And why? Because he's wanting us to be transformed in our minds. Um, you, you have a look when God does this um, with um, Isaiah. He does it. He puts the hot coal to his mouth and then he commissions him. He comes to Elijah, he brings the hot coals and then he commissions Elijah. He goes, Jesus goes to Peter, who has now betrayed Jesus by denying him three times and Jesus is there with a the meal and with hot coals and he comes to Jesus and Peter and he, he ministers to him and Peter repents and he recommissions him. Part of being under this juniper tree is that we need to deal what we need to deal with because God wants to recommission us. And I feel like that is the word that has God is saying today, is that there is a commissioning coming, and we need to prepare for what God is wanting to do. How am I doing? Oh, okay. Are you all with me? Nobody falling asleep? I'll bring you a load of the hot coals. <laughs> Josh knows. Josh thought it twitchy. <laughs> My beautiful boys here and with his wife, Nikki, they are supporting me. Right, so now, what does God do? He comes to Elijah. He says, Why are you doing here? Why are you here? And it's like it's time to deal with your problems. He doesn't leave you there. He doesn't leave you under that juniper tree. God comes to you. He says, What are you doing here? And he actually wants us to, to deal with this with him. He wants us to process it. So now you, you ask yourself, there was the moment where God says to Elijah, go and hide in the valley of Kerith and the raven, ravens will feed you. And now he's hiding under a juniper tree. Why is one right and one's wrong? Because it's so interesting, Kerith actually means cut away, as old uh, Lee's word, cut away to cut up or off pruning. So what actually God does, Elijah had faced Ahab, he faced these Baal, the prophets of Baal that wanted to kill him. God tells him, in obedience, Elijah goes and hides and he careths. He deals with all these, whatever's going on in his heart. But with the juniper tree, he runs in fear and he is isolated and he's not doing it in obedience to God and God has to come and find him. <clears throat> God really wants to process things with us. You know what I found in Soto? You ask people what the lies, and then you ask God what the lies, and then you ask them what the truth is, and you replace the lie with the truth. And one of the fascinating things I've found in Soto is that very often the truth that people give are given actually shows me the lie they're believing. And so God is so good, like he, he, he comes to Elijah and he, he deals with his fear. He says, what are you doing here? You know, he knows exactly what's going on inside of Elijah. He goes to Adam, and he deals with his shame. He says, where are you? He goes to, to Peter and deals with his betrayal and says, um, do you love me? And God is so amazing at actually dealing with the deep-rooted feelings that's going on inside of us. He knows us so well, and he is absolutely incredible to process things with and I have learned to ask him so many questions and he answers them. It's amazing. Then God comes along and he reminds him of his power and his tenderness and he says, I want you to go into the uh, want you to go into the cave and then he brings this massive storm, rocks flying, earthquake, then that opinion that's to my area. Then I'd be scared. Earthquake, fire, and then there's a still quiet voice and Elijah recognizes. God wasn't in all of the storms, but he was in the still quiet voice. And um, when we are under this juniper tree, the enemy's voice is very loud. And you know the enemy broadcasts messages, and we come into agreement with them, and they terrify us. 
So now, when um, Jezebel shouted out that curse, it actually says here, like a fluttering sparrow or a darting swallow, an undeserved curse does not come to rest. So when she was shouting out that curse, Elijah listened to it, and he came into agreement with it. And he said, she said, you are going to die. And he said, I want to die. How often are we agreeing with the, with the accuser in our lives and actually coming under the agreement of it? You know what the most amazing thing is? Elijah never died. He never died. He actually, two chariots of fire came and a whirlwind and took him up into heaven. He never died. Was it because he ate the bread of life? I don't know. But he never died. Her curse never landed. And we need to understand that we serve a God that is powerful and victorious. I think in that storm he was reminding Elijah, this is how powerful I am. Don't lose sight of how powerful I am. And so we need to quieten that voice of the enemy with truth. Put your headphones on. Let truth permeate your brain. Let that be the, the belt plate of truth that goes around your heart and keeps it steady in the time of adversity. Being a strong person of God does not mean that we will never feel discouraged, but it means not losing sight of God when faced with adversity. We are always going to be faced with adversity. That is life. There is no utopia until one day we are in heaven. I really want to challenge you today. Are you feeling like stepping out of the fight? Are you wanting to go and hide? I want to tell you, isolation is such a liar. Really, isolation is such a liar. God has never meant us to be alone. Isolation pulls us away from God when we get to listen to the voice of Emily instead of his. <clears throat> God still has work for you to do. You're not alone. And he wants to be with the team. And his plan is bigger than yours. God is commissioning. He commissioned Isaiah. He commissioned Elijah. He said, Elijah, go. Go and bring in the new generation of leaders. Go and bring in Elisha. You're not going to be alone. He's going to do it with you. He said to Peter. Jesus said to Peter. Peter was feeling terrible in his betrayal. And Jesus comes and restores him. Three times. The same amount of times that he's even out Christ. He says, do you love me? Do you love me? And he'd been fishing. He'd gone back, run away. I'll just be a fisherman again. I'm useless. Look what I did. And Jesus says, go and feed my sheep. We are always being commissioned. God never, ever, we, there are no lost causes sitting here. There are great men and women that have got the call of God on them. And God is calling us back into the fight. Don't give up on the fight. Get back into it. You see, Elijah wasn't this exceptional spiritual or superior being. He was completely human. He was completely human, but he was completely committed to the will of God. He, he, he had this moment, but it was that commitment to the will of God that he refocused and went back to serving God. You see, God uses the ordinary to do the extraordinary. Amen. Amen. Let's close our eyes. I really think that God wants to do business today. And this is just between you and him. We're not going to call anybody out for. But do keep your heart open and, and just allow him to come and just bring you that meal. You know, he brought the meal and showed him that his presence was there. And I believe God wants to show you today that his presence is here. That you're not forgotten. And that he is pursuing. And so... We thank you, Lord, for your incredible care. We thank you that you are such a gracious Father, that you actually came to earth to be like us so that we could be like you. What an amazing God you are. And so we just ask you right now to come and to give us courage again and to strengthen us and to, to allow you into our thinking 
that we begin to see with the mind of Christ again. That, Lord, that where there's stuff where we need to repent, where our lips need to be cleansed, that, Lord, that you would come and you would do that not because you were punishing us, but because you want to set us free. Lord, where we're carrying burdens that are not ours to carry, when we're being responsible for people when they should be responsible for themselves, where, Lord, we repent of that and we ask you to come and show us where you are in all these pictures. And so we just come and we commit ourselves to you today. We want to be like Isaiah. We want to be, send me, Lord, I will go. Isaiah felt so inadequate, but he said, send me, I will go. I thank you, Lord, that even as we talk about the apostolic opening up over the rock and how you want him to send us, there is not one of us that is not needed, Lord. There is not one of us that can step out of the fight. Every single one is needed for this fight. And so, Lord, I pray that we would feel a sense of that recommissioning coming over our hearts right now. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining the Rock Church broadcast service. We have reached the end of our service today. To find out more about who we are, visit our website at www.therock.org.za or contact our office on office at therock.org.za. Please join us again next week, the same time on the same platform. 